Welcome to the Los Angeles World Affairs Council and Town Hall. I'm Katie Gilman, the Communications Manager at the Council, and I'm excited to present today's program, Unveiling North Korea, a 2024 Perspective with Jenny Town. Jenny Town is a Senior Fellow at the Stimson Center, the Director of the Korea Program at the Stimson Center, and also the Director of Stimson's 38 North Program. Spencer Gross, LA World Affairs Council and Town Hall Programs Manager, will be moderating today's conversation. For those of you who would like to submit questions for Jenny, you can do so using the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. The audience Q&A portion of the program will begin in about 35 minutes. So without further ado, Spencer, I'll hand this conversation over to you. Thank you very much, Katie. And welcome, Jenny. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. And thank you, everyone who is taking time out of their day online to join us uh, here today. So I want to hop right into it with you. You know, North Korea is sort of one of these perennial issues in foreign affairs, right? It crops up in the news. And it feels like, from my perspective, that we've heard less and less about it sort of over the last couple of years, uh, unless you are specifically looking for information on what's happening. So I'm curious, what's happened over the last sort of three years um, in U.S.-North Korea relations, and where are we today? Well, we're not in a good place <laughs> in U.S.-North Korea relations. And essentially, um, we haven't really had good relations since 2019, right? Uh, the last time U.S. And, and North Korea had formal talks, uh, there was, of course, the, the summit in Hanoi um, in February of 2019, um, where especially the North Koreans expected that they were going to get this breakthrough, head-on breakthrough agreement that did not um, happen. Uh, the process didn't necessarily die then. There was still follow-up talks after that, um, but the the subsequent meeting and then the subsequent working level meeting that they had um, did not advance relations farther. And after that, what you saw at the end of 2019, for instance, was Kim Jong-un really talk about how um, he was really disillusioned um, at the idea that relations with the United States could change and could change in a way that would bring about benefits for the North Koreans. And we've seen them really kind of change alignments and change political tax since then to really focus their energies on um, building an economy more resilient to a sanctions of, of persistently hostile environment, a lot of rollback of, of economic reforms domestically. We saw the pandemic happen where they closed their borders. Um, but we also saw a real shift in their foreign policy away from states like the United States and South Korea, where everything is going to be hard fought, hard negotiated for maybe results, um, to really buying into the Cold War concept um, and aligning themselves with Russia, China, and other more sympathetic states that are willing to work with them regardless of sanctions. Um, where you know the gains that they get from that are, are generally smaller than what they could get if they could get sanctions lifted, um, but obviously politically much easier um, and with more faster and more tangible results. So you talk right there about how you know North Korea has sort of fundamentally shifted, and you uh, wrote a great article in the Arms Control Association recently where you touched on this, and I think Katie can post it into the chat for everybody if they're interested in learning more, where you say that, you know, North Korea's worldview has fundamentally changed. I mean, how has it fundamentally changed since these failed negotiations in 2019? Um, so I do think, you know, the, the North Koreans have kind of messaged um, different, the, the shifting worldview. Um, and I think on some level see a real decline in, in U.S. power and influence um, in the world, a real rise of, for instance, um, the great powers uh, of great power rivalry, including Russia and China, um, and was one of the first countries to really, you know, lean into the idea that a new Cold War was emerging. Um, and in that, to really bet on <laughs> um, China and Russia, and, and especially Russia, um, you know, leading into at the end of 2021, leading into 2022, and when when Russia attacked um, and in, invaded Ukraine, that was a real turning point, I think, to the North Koreans. And what we've seen then is, um, you know, really 
as as Russia China cooperation has grown and they've talked about their endless friendship um limitless friendship that um that North Korea has also put itself in there as to you know both um solid political alignment um, with both uh Russian and Chinese interests um as well as offering material support um, which has been obviously um, a, a real uh, cause for concern um, because for the first time since the Cold War, uh, since the fall of the Soviet Union, the first time we've really seen a country being willing to um, engage in military cooperation with the North Koreans to the point of including technology transfer, including you know selling arms and buying arms, um, and selling hardware, conventional hardware to the North Koreans as well. So, you know, this whole Russia, North Korea um, relationship has really grown into something more um, substantive, something that's very uh, favorable to the North Koreans. It obviously has benefits for the Russians in the Russians' goals now um, uh, in their own war in Ukraine, as well as in their broader concept of, of the war against the West. Um, and, you know, it's really created an environment where North Korea um, it has been able to basically, as you talked about before, um, I think one of their biggest accomplishments has been able to kind of normalize their weapons testing behavior to the point where they can do these. You don't have the consensus in the international community now um, against them in terms of of applying additional punitive measures against them for doing that. And you don't see the media attention. People aren't really talking about it anymore because there's been so many missile tests and because there have been so few kind of punitive measures in the process. So, you know, what is the effect for the US administration, right? So for, for the Biden administration of this sort of pivot by the North Koreans to Russia. I mean, has the Biden administration been trying to negotiate with the North Koreans um, and nothing's happening? And or is there something else going on? Well, the the administration has reached out to the North Koreans, has put out there that they're open to diplomacy. Um, and the public narrative, though, the you know, it, it used to be that anytime, anywhere, let's meet up without a specific um, to, uh, without a specific topic of what that discussion would be. Um, generally, you kind of leaving it open-ended of like whatever the North Koreans want to talk about, we, we're willing to talk about. Um, but at the same time, a lot of US government statements still really press upon the need for denuclearization and, and a real focus on the nuclear issue, which then, you know, other statements about being willing to talk about other things just don't have any credibility. Um, to the to the North Koreans. Um, so I, I think, you know, we're at a time now where North Korea is not willing to talk about its nuclear program, is not willing to negotiate on its nuclear program. In 2022, they passed a new um, law that laid out, not only enshrined the nuclear program, um, you know, in their constitution, in law, but their nuclear, laid out their nuclear doctrine as well. Um, and when they unveiled it, you know, Kim Jong-un did talk about also how, uh, you know, the time for negotiations had passed, um, that this was no longer on the table, it was no longer something they would be willing to bargain away, um, but that it's there for both self-defense as well as the protection of its own interests, um, which is an interesting, uh, you know, uh, an interesting new nuance um, to how they think about their nuclear program and, and what it can accomplish for them. Um, so as long as we continue, as long as the administration continues to sort of put out that message of like, at the end of the day, we still want to talk about denuclearization, um, there just isn't a lot of uh, appeal an incentive for the North Koreans to actually come back to negotiations, especially when they're getting so much from the Russians and they still have, you know, strong political support from the Chinese as well. Is there anything that the United States could could offer you know, the North Koreans that would actually bring them back to the table at this point? Or is that door just just fully closed, essentially? Um, there's there's nothing that's politically palatable <laughs> um, that the U.S. would be willing to go so far as to do stuff, uh, especially, again, when the Russians are so forward-leaning right now. 
um, you know, the U.S. is never going to offer military assistance to North Korea and technical cooperation on military, you know, for the North Koreans. Um, I, I think there is, you know, a case to be made for if we wanted to, if we wanted to retake some agency in our policy, because right now we've created a, a policy approach that really requires North Korea to do something positive on the nuclear realm first. It doesn't have to be full denuclearization, of course, and everyone understands denuclearization doesn't happen overnight. But like, if they don't do something positive first, then we're kind of stuck. If they're not willing to talk about denuclearization, then we're kind of stuck. We're stuck waiting for a time when they might be. And that time is becoming less and less likely um, if it is at all possible anymore. Right. So I do think if we wanted to create a diplomatic opportunity, there are things we could do, such as consider, for instance, um, lifting, you know, sanctions on like one commercial sector um, from the time that, uh, you know, since 2017, there's been sanctions on like textiles and seafood. Um, and these are these are sanctions that, you know, had targeted North Korea's income earning potential. Um, but that also had social benefit, right? It was actually jobs for North Koreans, uh, factory workers, fishermen, that kind of thing. Um, and North Korea has adapted, right? So if they can't do legal business, they've really doubled down on their cyber crimes, their cryptocurrencies, things like that, to the point where now those commercial sectors um, the earning potential of them is a fraction of what North Korea is making through illicit activities now. Um, and the problem is now is that with like cyber and crypto, for instance, there's no social benefit there, right? So, you know, the people who are being most affected by sanctions are not the regime, um, are not the elites, but they're the, you know, the, the sort of the blue collar workers of North Korea. And so I think there's a case to be made for reconsidering um, why we continue with those sanctions. And if we need to make it more politically palatable, consider maybe even swapping out those sanctions for sanctions that do actually target illicit activity. That, that's really interesting. Are, is, I'm actually curious because this is an area I'm very well versed in. Are there not a ton of sanctions on sort of illicit activity from North Korea in terms of the cyber realm? It seems like from your answer, that's a place that we could go deeper. Um, but it also feels like every time North Korea does something because that we do more sanctions, right? So I'm actually curious, I mean, is there anything left besides some, you know, criminal entities to sanction? I mean, the, the idea of sanctions in the cyber realm are, are difficult to begin with, right? Because they're always behind the curve. Um, but the, there are entities to sanction. Um, I, I think, you know, in terms of illicit activities, you could also even now double down on like arms trade <laughs> um, if you wanted something more concrete um, to go after versus the commercial trade sectors where, you know, it would actually provide some social benefit to North Koreans and give North Koreans some incentive to engage in more normal legal behavior right so you know the i i'm not a sanctions expert i'm i'm definitely not a cyber sanctions expert um there are you know definitely discussions going on about what to target and where to target and how you might target that um and i think there there are ways to shift the focus of what's being targeted um again away from those commercial sectors um, to really trying to double down on where North Korea is actually focusing its attention these days um, in those uh, in those illicit activities. Fantastic. Um, to sort of shift, we've been talking a lot about sort of what's been happening in sort of the past four years, but the shift to more forward looking, you know, we have sort of pretty consequential elections coming up here in the United States uh, in the, this fall. You know, Donald Trump was very sort of active with North Korea, right? Meeting Kim Jong Un multiple times, and I'm curious, you know, if the elections, whether Joe Biden is reelected or Donald Trump is elected, if that's going to have any effect on sort of North Korea policy, or if the North Koreans are probably rooting for one side or the other, or for if for them, it pretty much makes no difference at this point. 
Um, I, I think the North Koreans have made pretty clear they don't really like Joe Biden. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, with a, a second Biden administration, um, there's a better sense of what to expect, right? Um, I, I wouldn't expect major policy shifts from what we see now. Um, and or even major personnel shifts from the first term to a second term, if there is a second term. Um, and so I think, you know, the, the North Koreans are probably looking at that, like if, if Biden gets reelected, it's four more years of pretty much the same approaches and same policies. Um, the X factors, of course, would be, you know, future South Korean elections, um, and how that might affect, um, you know, Washington's priorities and calculus along the way. Uh, but that's far, far down the road. Um, if, you know, the whole, is North Korea rooting for Trump? Probably um, in the sense of they don't like Biden. <laughs> uh, but, you know, does it mean they're just waiting for Trump to come back to negotiations? I, I don't think that's the right um, calculation either. Um, you know, if you look at sort of the disillusionment that, that Kim Jong-un expressed in his letters um, to Trump that were, you know, released at some point, um, and just, you know, the idea of even in the last year of Trump's presidency, you know, there was no real communication even when um, North Korea still had the chance to communicate with him. Um, the reality is, is during the negotiation process where they thought Trump would be willing to do more um, and had committed to some things he still couldn't deliver. So it was, it, it was as much disillusionment with Trump as it was with Moon when it comes to the North Koreans of a, a lot of commitments, a lot of optimism, um, but unable to deliver actual results. And so I think, you know, while they might be, while the North Koreans might be friendlier to the idea of a Trump, a second Trump administration, um, it doesn't necessarily mean they'll come running back to negotiations as soon as he's in office. Um, I do think there's an X factor though, and that is, of course, you know, Putin-Kim relations is good now. Um, my my guess is that like a Trump administration's you know top foreign policy priority is likely to be Russia, and how that relationship um, you know evolves, and how you know potentially the war in Ukraine ends. Well, I think will also have significant implications on um, on North Korea's worldview as well as you know potential for US North Korea um whether it's through Putin or or you know even just because of that relationship I, I think there's some interesting but concerning opportunities there as well it, it feels like there's been in a lot of ways a historic shift in sort of what North Korea's geopolitical sort of calculation is from China to Russia in these last couple of years. And then that's really sort of affected what the United States' options are in regards to North Korea. Yeah, well, I, I think the big question, though, is, is this a sustainable, um, you know, uh, shift? Or is it opportunistic? And I, I think there's I think there's a lot more reason to believe it's opportunistic than something that's really meant to be long lasting and a, a forever kind of arrangement. Um, certainly right now, North Korea's number one focus is Russia because Russia is willing to do things um, that really benefit North Korea. Um, but but Russia is willing to do things right now that benefit North Korea because it benefits Russia um, and it, 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 it helps Russia achieve its interests, its national interests. The question is going to be, of course, um, how the war in Ukraine ends, what Russia's standing is at that point, and how that affects Russia's worldview. Will they still see benefit in having North Korea as a military partner? Will they still be willing to give North Korea and work with North Korea in the ways that they are now? Um, and, you know, 
if they're not, <laughs> if that changes, then, um, you know, how does that change the relationship between the two? And my guess is um, pretty drastically at that point. I don't, e I don't think either side really sees this as a forever sustainable kind of operation. You know, to, to look forward again, you know, for the sort of remainder of, of, of 2024, I'm curious, you know, we've, we've had these periods in the past, right, you know, 2010, right, where you had a lot of, you know, sort of pro provocative actions by the North Koreans, including, you know, sinking of South Korean ships and shelling of, of islands. And, you know, you had the 2019, so, you know, 2017 sort of fire and fury era, right, where you had a lot of, you know, pro North Korean provocations. And I'm curious if you think that we'll see sort of an uptick in, you know, what, what might be construed as provocative actions, you know, anytime in the near future, or if we're sort of so inert at this point to what North Korea does that even if there was an uptick in rocket testing or, you know, drills that like the U.S. media might not even pay attention at this point. Um, well, well, I think we're seeing that they're not really paying attention at this point already. Um, you know, the, you know, back in 2022, um, that was the year North Korea did the most testing it's ever done, right? And I think it was something like 46 ballistic missiles were launched that year, um, 96 projectiles, so including like cruise missiles. Um, but, you know, there, there was a big difference between what we saw at the beginning of that year and what we saw at the end of that year. In the beginning of that year, what you saw was North Korea testing new systems and like doing developmental R&D kind of weapons testing of, of new systems. Um, what you saw at the end of the year, or what you saw in the second half of the year was a real shift. Um, that first half, you know, these were all things that the North Koreans had, in, you know, that were included in the five-year plan. These were the goals for the WMD program and, and the um, technologies that they wanted to achieve. And you saw the way they talked about that, you know, Kim Jong-un wasn't there. These were developmental tests. The, the statements were generally from low-level or lower-level officials uh, talking about how how the technology performs, but also that it, it basically was checking off boxes against the plan. Um, in the second half of the year, what you saw was a much more politically driven agenda. So the beginning of actual missile deployment drills, missile operation drills, um, and those were things that Kim Jong-un was overseeing. It suddenly was in the, the front page of, of North Korean news. Um, and, you know, the Rodong Shinmun and, and the di party dailies and stuff. So, it, it, you know, there was definitely a, a political motivation to what they were doing. And what you've seen since then is more politically motivated of, you know, they want the world to see that they've made these advancements. Kim Jong-un has been there. There's been the great video of him in the, you know, Top Gun style jacket and aviators and, you know, the theatrics around it. Um, to, to demonstrate like how proud they are of achieving these technologies um, and, and in a way that, that's very geared towards an external audience um, versus you know, those developmental testing that was geared more towards the domestic audiences and, and talking about achievements against the plan. Um, so I, I think that you know, what you're seeing in, in terms of the political and the politically driven um, demonstrations. A lot of this is coming from a sort of chicken and egg, right? Like the the South Koreans, U.S. and South Korea have done a number of um, uh, back to back large scale live fire military exercises, um, and some of them have been standard exercises, and some some of them have been in response to things that North Korea has done. So if North Korea does missile test, and the U.S. and South Korea do. Um, some kind of new uh, military drill or air drills, you know, as a way to demonstrate they won't be intimidated. Then you have the North Koreans responding with military drills to demonstrate they won't be intimidated. And this has gone kind of back and forth and escalated over time. And, and we're sort of caught in this escalation spiral because we have no real diplomatic channels to discuss what's going on or even to try and choreograph um, a, a, 
a, a diplomatic off ramp off, you know, a, a de escalation. Um, so I, I think there's there's a lot of dangers right now, just in terms of, you know, if something goes wrong, if there's an accident in one of these and something gets detonated in the wrong place, if there's, um, you know, what is the breaking point? What is uh, to which one side or the other decides what they're seeing isn't just a drill. Um, and because we have sort of fuzzy pink lines now everywhere as to, you know, how much is too much, it's really hard to tell um, what will trigger um, the perception of something more, um, more dangerous um, and how, how will they respond to that. So, um, you know, yeah, and all of this is happening at a time, of course, where there's so many things going on in the world and there's already, you know, hot wars going on in other regions um, where, you know, it has obviously the South Koreans and, and the Japanese is, are are very concerned about what happens if conflict breaks out and it's a multi-front conflict, where do resources go and, and how will that be addressed? Yeah, it's it's it sounds like that, you know, the, the fuzzy pink lines are what keeps you up at night in terms yeah. of that. There really could be a miscalculation at some point in the future. And the real the real risk here is not an intentional you know provocation right where or an intentional sort of act of war but really something that one side whether that's the u.s south korea uh the north koreas or maybe even the, the japanese do as sort of a you know a deterrence measure right trying to show that right you know don't mess with us and it's taken as the other side as as an attack and and correct me if i'm wrong but we talked about the sort of nuclear laws that were enshrined in the north korean constitution and I believe that some of those did authorize the preemptive use of, of nuclear weapons in certain situations. Is that correct? So, so the nuclear law did. What was in China in constitution was the mandate to keep developing um, nuclear weapons as the right and the and the the mandate to do so. But yeah, in the nuclear law, um, there's five conditions that the that the North Koreans lay out as to when they would consider nuclear use and three of them have preemptive clauses um you know if they believe that or perceive that you know that there is an attack coming against their leadership against their nuclear assets or any kind of you know nuclear attack in general um they you know they reserve the right for you preemptive potentially preemptive nuclear use um i do think you know, I, I think we should be a little bit careful when we talk about that of like, yes, of course, um, the those are conditions under which they would consider it. It does not say they will actually, that they have to do it, um, simply that that is one of the things that could trigger that. And I do think there is a lot of the doctrine that is in direct response to though, to, um, you know, South Korean doctrine as well, that also um, emphasizes uh, the the right to preemption, and so you do have again a very potentially unpredictable, volatile situation that's really based on perception, threat perception. Um, when you have both sides also with very strong, very muscular rhetoric against each other. Um, and, you know, increasingly a lot of exercises and a lot of things that can be, that can potentially be misconstrued. And that's, yeah, those are the things that keep me up at night. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, we have just, just a little over five minutes until we go to the audience Q&A. And I was reading through that, that article you wrote for Arms Control Association. And one of the things that actually stuck out to me was the sort of the section on Travis King, uh, private, private Travis King, who, who, you know, ran across the DMZ, right, um, you know, a, a couple of months ago. I'm forgetting the exact date. And you wrote essentially that it's it, it was a, a missed opportunity, right, um, that, you know, things went pretty smoothly in terms of North Korea repatriating him to the United States. And and we we missed the boat in terms of here was an opportunity maybe to sort of reengage in a normal way um, or even in a back channel way with the North Koreans. And I'm hoping that you can sort of talk about that for the audience about sort of what we did and didn't do um, and why maybe that was a missed opportunity. 
Um, and, and granted, it was a small, a small opportunity. Um, but I do think, you know, we we've gotten to a point where we we really assign the most sinister intent to everything North Korea does. And so when there are potentially positive signals or, or actions in this case, um, we we don't necessarily acknowledge them, especially publicly. Um, I think you know the the idea that that Travis King was returned without incident within you know a reasonable amount of time um, should have at least been publicly acknowledged. I, I believe there there was sort of back channel thanks for this, um, but you know this was a a real chance to say that you know in the midst of all this political bluster and, and military bluster that's going back and forth that we still acknowledge when states do good things <laughs> or or make the right choices. And this was a case where, you know, a public acknowledgement of, of, you know, this, of, of being able to work with the North Koreans um, towards a positive result uh, could have, and, and public acknowledgement of them, public discussion of that could have had at least some built some goodwill. Um, you know, I'm not saying it it would have necessarily led to negotiations, but it, it definitely could have built some goodwill that could have maybe opened, reopened an opportunity for back channel talks or something. But I, I feel like the the sort of public silence on it um, and on the positive outcome. Um, was really a, a, a not a it was really a missed opportunity to do something to try and rebuild a relationship with the North Koreans. So we're getting a ton of questions coming into the Q and A. So I, I want to move to to our audience Q and A. And you know we've one of the first questions that's come in here is about how does Putin and, and sort of the Kremlin Kremlin writ large view sort of North Korea's nuclear weapon development? Is it a good thing? Is it an annoying thing? Is it, you know, sort of meh? Well, I would say it's definitely changed in the last year. Um, so, you know, of, of course, in the UN Security Council in the past, when North Korea made strides in its nuclear weapons development, um, the the resolutions that have passed have been passed unanimously, including the Russians and the Chinese. Um, but, you know, since the war, since Russia started the war in Ukraine, uh, you know, North Korea has been one of the only countries that has been um, fully politically backing Russia in that process, offering both political support and, and material support even before Russia was willing to accept material support from the North Koreans. Uh, and that I think has, did make an impression um, as Russia's pariah status in the international community continues to grow. Um, but I, I think, you know, the, the calculation here is not just about Ukraine, even though Ukraine plays a, a significant role in it and, and offers Russia um, a military advantage uh, of having extra artillery, having extra, um, you know, missiles to use in the battlefield. Um, but in the larger kind of war against the West and trying to undermine a US-led or Western-led international order, um, certainly Russia has found other economic partners, political and economic partners in that. And I think if you look at you know the expansion of BRICS recently. Um, it it shows there's there's other states that also you know buy into the the a multipolar system and the the need for some counterbalance to some of the Western led institutions out there. Um, what North Korea offers, I think now in the Russian calculation, I think is is a military partner in the war against the West. So, you know, yes, there's strong Russia-China um, ties, but China does not openly offer military support, even if there is military support. It does not always offer political support. Um, 
even if it doesn't speak out against Russia, right? Like there's a lot of times where China might abstain from a vote versus actually, you know, voting in a in a way favorable to Russia. Whereas North Korea again is there. <laughs> they're willing to be open. They're willing to be um, on Russia's side. They're willing to cooperate openly, freely with Russia, and um, and the Russians are you know rewarding them for that. Um, and it, it does create then, you know, at the end of the day, it does create a military partner who does have nuclear weapons um, at its side in, in a broader war against the West. Um, so yes, China is also there, but China is not as there as North Korea is there. And so I think at this point in time, I, I think that has been a lot of the Russian calculation as to what North Korea can do for them. You know, one of the, the second question we have here, we talked about cybercrime and we talked about, you know, how the North Koreans are, are getting a large infusion, infusions of cash, right, from these illicit activities. Um, but the, the question is, where are these North Korean sort of threat actors and criminal agencies getting the knowledge to commit, right, these, these cybercrimes? Like, is there an internal sort of university system that's teaching people how to hack into things is it coming from the chinese or the russians like who is helping them commit these these crimes um well you know when there's a will there's a way <laughs> and the the north koreans prove that over and over and over um if you look at you know north korean education those system and educational priorities um there has been a heavy emphasis on science and technology for a number of years um and and an implementation of you know improving science and technology education a pretty systematic improvement of that over especially during the kim jong-un years um so you know there is opportunities to learn computer science. There are, you know, we've seen North Koreans back in the day host cryptocurrency conferences and cyber conferences, and there are, you know, international guests there. I mean, that's how the whole um, Virgil Griffith <laughs> um, case came about. Uh, he had attended one of these cryptocurrency conferences and, and was teaching them about how to do crypto mining and stuff. So it, it exists. Um, there are North Koreans who will study at other universities as well. We did a, a report uh, we've done a couple of reports on at 38 North that also address even just um, the idea that in their science and technology journals, you can see in some of the footnotes where some of the scientists have had, um, you know, international cooperation, international collaboration in different technologies and sciences over the years. Um, where they've studied, who they've studied with in some cases. Um, the kinds of projects and kinds of technologies that they've been looking into. So I think there is some internal learning, there's some external learning that happens that then gets transferred back to, um, you know, to others once they get back to uh, North Korea. Um, and certainly there are also, you know, other North Korean in the IT um, in IT capacities that are working outside of North Korea. Um, in China, especially um, in, in other countries that have access uh, to information and to learning and are working in other, you know, other IT companies. So some of the stuff that happens, um, you know, isn't necessarily generated from inside North Korea. It might be enacted outside of North Korea um, in some of these, you know, other in like China, for instance, at an IT firm in China, they might be doing something. Um, but they're also super persistent about it. So it might not be state of the art techniques and technologies that they're using. But for instance, there was the the swift heist that went on several years ago now that um, that when they were doing the forensics of it, they found that North Koreans had been basically um, monitoring swift transactions for about three years before they did anything to better understand how SWIFT was moving money around, how these transactions would um, were, were happening and so that they could pinpoint the times where they could make moves that they'd be you know, the, the least detectable. Um, so 
the the amount of patience <laughs> and the amount of of um of just real uh deliberate um energy that they put into these is is quite large because it's something that you know they've prioritized and they want to do and and like I said where there's a will there's a way our our next audience question is is asking you know Basically, you, you've mentioned that it seems like the door for negotiations towards denuclearization is, is closed. And therefore, sort of what should the U.S. be working towards at this point to make the relationship more positive or at least to have some sort of relationship that's on neutral ground so that the lines maybe become less pink and fuzzy and there's less of, you know, those things that keep us up at night? Yeah. I mean, there's a case to be made for a risk reduction um, agenda in the short term, um, you know, preventing nuclear conflict is, I think, somewhat uncontroversial <laughs> um, and in everyone's interest. Um, I, I think there's, uh, but I think in order even to get to that, there's also a while it seems uncontroversial, there's there is some controversy to it, um, because the the problem that North Korea poses is um, is you know U.S. nuclear doctrine has been really focused around the idea of you know of a two peer system, right? So we have a nuclear armed Russia and a nuclear armed China, so a two peer nuclear to nuclear peer dilemma um or near peer depending on how you want to define it but north korea is the only country we have that's necessarily a non-peer nuclear armed adversary and that's something that i don't think we've really quite figured out yet how to handle <laughs> um and and because of that because they're a non-peer um, it also makes some of the discussions that we would have with our peer adversaries or near peer adversaries less appealing and less politically palatable again of like, do you give North Korea the legitimacy of the kinds of conversations you would have with another great power just because they have nuclear weapons and what are the then the um, the implications of that and what are what are the optics of that right how does that affect calculus in say for instance iran um so I, I think you know there is there is definitely a lot of rethinking and recalibration that needs to happen um given the major shifts that we've seen in in north korean policy um both about its nuclear program nuclear posture nuclear doctrine as well as its you know world view and and foreign policy um that make it really difficult um to find a new opening but it it requires also some proactive moves on our part, not just to say, hey, we'll meet anytime, anywhere to talk about anything, um, but to, to, to give them a reason why they would want to do that. <laughs> um, if they don't believe that we're actually going to make any concessions, if they don't believe we're actually, that they can actually get anything from it while they're getting, you know, a, a lot of assistance and a lot of benefits um, from like, you know, the, the other side of the political paradigm, um, even discussions about, you know, risk reduction become less appealing. Interesting. You know, in terms of talking about risk reduction, one of the questions from the audience is about how likely a war will be on the Korean Peninsula sort of any time in the short to medium term. And I know there has been some increased sort of articles around that conflict is more likely, more likely or maybe even inevitable between North and South Korea or between North Korea and the United States. And so you know, how likely do you think it is that there might be, you know, some level of conflict between, you know, the Koreas or between North Korea and the United States in the short to medium term? 
I still think it's not super likely. I think it's kind of low likelihood. I think both Koreas, I don't think either Korea wants a war, um, even though both Koreas are talking about war readiness, right? There's a difference between being ready and prepared to fight a war than there is saying that, oh, because we're ready, because we're prepared, then we're going to start a war, right? And I think if you look at um, even North Korean rhetoric on this, um, there's been some controversy over, you know, the increased or the emergence of, of language where they used to talk about combat readiness to now war readiness and what does that mean? Um, and, you know, I think there's still many ways to interpret this, especially again, because every country talks about war readiness. And this is why we're doing military drills um, on both sides of the DMZ. This is why, you know, countries um, have to think through command and control and, and continuity of government and continuity of economy in case of war. Um, and especially because the geopolitical situation is conflict prone. Um, but, you know, again, if you look at the way North Korea frames even discussions about a war, it is still in contingency. So in contingency, um, you know, the they've They've, they've shifted from just like combat preparedness and a willingness to, you know, a, the ability to defend the country to now in a contingency, the, the goal would be to take the peninsula. So there is a shift there in, in terms of what, what they think their theory of war is, um, but it, it is not, again, that we are going to start it, <laughs> that the war is coming, but more so like if it starts, we're ready to fight it. And our strategy is going to be not just defense, but, you know, but then the revolutionary war will start. Um, and I think that nuance needs to be acknowledged um, more and internalized more where, again, um, that the rhetoric, even though the rhetoric is getting more muscular, it's more muscular on both sides. Um, and that, you know, there's still a lot of everything that's couched in, in a contingency, this is what we would do, even while it comes across very threatening. Mm. We, we have another question that sort of dovetails from that, that is just curious about what we know of anything about North Korea's nuclear targeting, right? Do we know anything about sort of what they would target in South Korea or against the US and their actual capabilities to do that? Or is that sort of a black box of the intelligence world that we don't really have view into? I mean, I think the only insight in the open source community that we have is any of the posters that they haven't blurred out <laughs> when they show pictures of Kim and generals in a room together, right? They, whatever they want us to see, we've seen. Um, whether that means that's the actual plan and, and everything, you know, it's hard to say, right? So, you know, the, the, there's a, a lot of talk about what they might do. And there's a, there's certainly, um, capabilities that North Korea is trying to demonstrate in order to, um, in order to establish some credibility that they have, you know, some of these capabilities, like to be able to target, you know, cities in the U.S. and the continental U.S. as well as in the region. Um, so certainly their capabilities are growing. Certainly they're showing us more and more insights as to, in a contingency, what they might be targeting or might be trying to um, trying to go after, but you know, how much, how much we actually are sure of any of these things, uh, I think, especially based on open sources, it is is still a lot of uncertainty. Thank you. Yeah, it, it seems like that there is there is still a black box effect where it comes into a lot of North Korea, right? There's, we see what, like you were saying, we see what they want us to see in, in some aspects, right? Um, you know, I'm curious, we, we've gotten some some audience questions, right, that are, are curious about sort of talking about continuity of government, about, you know, this, his sister and his son. 
and whether we think that there's any messaging happening there and what what that those messages are right are they telling us that hey we're prepared we have sort of you know we're a stable government or is there other things that they're the north koreans are trying to tell sort of the united states or other international actors i mean it's a good question and everyone has a theory um and all of the theories have some merit to them um, about, you know, why we're seeing, you know, what role does Kim Yo Jung play? What role does Kim Jue, his daughter, play now that she's been shown? Um, I, I would just say, you know, with with Kim Yo Jung, obviously Kim Jong Un has has a special relationship with his sister. He trusts her. She is a Kim, so she carries sort of the the gravity of being a Kim when she says, and the authority of being a member of the Kim family when she says something, um, with still the plausible deniability of Kim Jong Un to change course, right? So, and we saw that especially back in 2020 when they did, um, when they when they demolished the Inter Korean Liaison Office, and Kim Yo Jong at that time was of course leading a talked about a four point military plan in response to the, the South Korean leaflets that were coming across the border. Um, you know, and she was at that time very, again, very muscular rhetoric, talking about this four point um, military plan uh, and that they were, you know, this sort of punishment to, to South Korea and very quickly Kim Jong-un stepped in and shut it down. Um, and I would say since then, we have not seen Kim Yo Jung in a real military oriented um, endeavor. And, and so I think there is something to be said for that. We've seen her still as a, as a political spokesperson on a number of different issues, especially um, dealing with South Korea and with the US and, and recently with uh, Japan, um, but not in a military capacity. With the daughter, it's, it, you know, there, there's a lot of things that people ascribe to, like, well, we've never seen this before, so it must mean X. Well, we've, but we've never seen it before because the Kim family has never actually revealed its children at such a young age before. So everything is new. So it's hard to tell exactly what message they are trying to send. Is it to show that he's a family man? Um, and so, you know, has his daughter with him at different events that he thinks are politically important. Um, is it, you know, that they're trying to build her bona fides in case, you know, as a as a potential successor? Um, it would seem a little, it, it obviously seems odd to to say that considering one, he he is believed to have a son who we haven't seen. Um, and, uh, and she's, you know, nine, <laughs> 10, um, you know, it's a little early for that kind of, of kind of grooming, um, in that way. Uh, so, you know, the, and, and, and none of these are like mutually exclusive either. Right. So it could be all of a number of different things. It could be something completely different. We just don't know. And, you know, every point of information that comes out every time we see her, we're adding points of information to that assessment. Um, but we're still really piecing together something very new. Um, so, you know, I, I think it's, uh, there's some reason to hold back judgment quite yet as to what the actual meaning is, because I, I think there's a lot of, I think there's a lot of ways in which she's being used now that aren't necessarily succession oriented, um, but really have to do with building up Kim Jong-un's image as well in playing into the tropes that he wants to play, um, both as a looking like a family man and a leader that cares about the people. I think when she first came out, it came out at a time when, again, the there was shifting narratives about their nuclear program that it was not just for, it wasn't for a bargaining, but it was, you know, for protection for generations. And that's when we kind of first saw her pop up. So the, there's a lot of political signaling that her presence can play. Um, but what that means in terms of larger 
plans for her, it, it's still very unclear. So she could she could play a lot a lot of roles, right? You know, um, and so we should expect the North Korean nuclear, you know, nuclear set for kids, you know, anytime. Uh, you know, and I would also think of it as as North Korea, as Kim Jong Un tries to look more and more like a normal world leader. Um, how many times do you see, you know, other world leaders with their kids? Like, you know, Trump had his kids working in the White House. You know, Obama had, you know, there was lots of photo ops with his, you know, with his two daughters, um, you know, doing dad things or bringing them to events and stuff. So I, I think, you know, there there's a lot of ways to interpret um, what we're seeing. And there's a lot of merit to a lot of different ways to interpret what we're seeing. So it, it's, you know, like I said, I, I think there's there's reason to reserve judgment on what it is they're actually hoping to do in terms of longer term planning and signaling. So we only have uh, about four minutes left, um, and I have one final question for you, but it's it's a pretty overarching one. So we've been talking a lot during this this webinar about sort of the increased role that Russia is now playing in North Korea's you know relationship um, and its relationship with the world as a source of income um, and as well as a source of exports. But we haven't talked a lot about China, right? And I'm curious what role that you see for China sort of in the future of, of North Korea, right? We, we talked about how, you know, Russia is sort of the, the country of the moment, but not potentially eternally. Um, and China is one of the two countries that borders North Korea. So, you know, what is their relationship like today and how much, if any, power over North Korea does China have? Um, I, China's power is more limited. China's influence in Pyongyang is more limited now than in the past because, because again, they're just not willing to do the kinds of things Russia is doing right now. Um, and North Korea will shift its resources and focus to where it can get most benefit. Um, my understanding is relations aren't great, <laughs> but at the same time, um, you know, the, there's still there is still a relationship, right? And there is still a, a way in which North Korea fits into a, a Chinese worldview um, of concerns about US-led encirclement in the region, Western-led encirclement in the region against China. Um, so that gives them, one, an incentive to have friends, um, including North Korea maintain you know, strong friendships um, that on their side of the growing ideological divide, um, but also some sympathy for North Korea when when they're looking at sort of the same disturbing trends in the region, right? So the idea of increased U.S., South Korea, Japan trilateral security cooperation is something that concerns the Chinese and is something that concerns the North Koreans too. So it's like, you know, on some level, it still fits into that narrative. Um, and there's still a reason to cultivate that relationship, the reason for Beijing to want to continue to maintain that relationship, even if North Korea is doing things um, that goes against their interests. The same as with Russia, even though Russia is doing things that China doesn't agree with and that work against Chinese interests, there's still a reason to maintain that friendship um, or, and that partnership in the face of growing great power competition. Well, Jenny, thank you so much for asking, answering all of our questions today. Let me hand it over to my colleague, Katie Gilman. Yeah, well, thank you again, Jenny and Spencer, for engaging our audience today with this really fascinating conversation. Jenny, I hope that we can have you back in the future. Um, your insights are really so valuable. And thank you to our audience for submitting all of your great questions. Uh, at the Council, we have an exciting lineup of future programming that I want to quickly draw everyone's attention to. So tomorrow, we're hosting a panel discussion with three U.S. Army War College fellows at USC on the policy and national security nexus. And next Friday, April 19th, we host the chairs of the Foreign Affairs Committees of the Baltic Nations to discuss Russia's aggression towards Ukraine from a Baltic perspective. 
Uh, this is an in-person program at the Union Bank Plaza Conference Center, which is in downtown LA. And then on May 2nd, Dan Schnur will return for his monthly Dan Schnur political report. And this month he'll discuss Biden, Trump, or Kennedy, how will a third party candidate affect the 2024 campaign? So you can find more information on and register for these programs on our website. So make sure to check that out. And with that, have a great rest of your day and we hope to see you at an upcoming program. Mm -hmm.